Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing The King is Coming. Or if you want to sing The Spring is Coming, can you sing that? No, I probably don't sing that. <laughs> Let's sing together. Let every eye be fixed upon King Jesus. Let every tribe and tongue prepare the way. Let every heart be filled with expectation Cause the King is coming Oh, the King is coming So open the doors up Come let the light in People get ready Ready to worship Him Open the doors up Come let the light in People get ready, bow down and worship. Here we go. Singing holy is the Lord.
all into this space. My name is Julie, if I've never introduced myself. This is Rosie, and this is Jessica, her daughter, and this is Brian, as you all know, and the amazing worship team that we have. Um, I just want to start off by saying that you might see us wearing these uh, green shirts up here. This is for a women's retreat that we have in May. For all you ladies that are looking for new beginnings to spread light and to spread the hope into the world, go sign up online and uh, let's make it a, a retreat to remember. And I just want to say something as I look into this space that we're in. I see God doing something so big. He is stirring in every single one of you, in one of us. And as this world is a place of a lot of judgment, sometimes, you know, we feel oppressed and we don't show up and give ourselves fully. We're not vulnerable because we're afraid of what others might have to say. We're afraid of the labels that will be placed on us. So that prevents us from being who we truly are and just showing up and worshiping the Lord. But as we move into this next song, I just ask that we turn our hearts and our spirits to the Lord and let this song and the lyrics speak to us just like it did for me. I ask that we abandon our fears, we abandon our failures, and abandon ourselves and surrender to the feet of the Lord and that we worship and glorify his wonderful name. Amen. Something isn't adding up This wild exchange you offer us I gave my worst, you gave your blood Seems hard to believe You're telling me you chose the cross You're telling me I'm worth that much If that's the measure of your love How else would I sing? I'm complete
you're the provider in everything for us. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome, welcome. My name is Brent. I'm on staff here at Kensington. Whether you are in the building or online, hi guys. I want to welcome you. Whether you've been following Jesus for a long time or whether you're just exploring, whether you call Kensington your home or whether you're here for the first time, uh, welcome. This is a great space. Um, I invite you to journey along with us, right? So this week is uh, very special in the lives of uh, the Christ whole Christian movement. Um, on Friday, we celebrate Good Friday, which is when Jesus died. And it was so much more than just um, a, 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 an expression of his love for us. It literally changed um, how we can react or interact with God. We, Jesus offered us reconciliation with God. That's a big deal. And we want to celebrate that on Friday. And then we move right into Easter. Easter Sunday is next Sunday. Uh, we're going to have two services, 9 and 11. Please don't show up at 10. You'll be like too late for one and too early for another. 9 and 11, we will have um, K kids from birth to four years old in the morning at 9. And then full K kids um, from, bless you. Full, full K kids um, at the second service at 11 o'clock. This is just going to be a great weekend. I also wanted to encourage you, just before you leave the door, there's a, a little uh, stand with some invite cards. Um, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you know people who are also journeying, right? Um, I would encourage you to invite them into this space. Uh, Easter is a lot of times like the one Sunday that some people feel comfortable coming to church, right? So we want to inv invite them to Kensington um, to help them experience uh, what it means to walk with Jesus. So take one of these invite cards or a whole fistful, pass them out, and uh, let's pack this place um, for both of those services. Um, another exciting thing that's coming up in, in April, it'd be April 14th, so three weeks from today, we're going to celebrate baptisms. So if you have decided to follow Jesus and you haven't taken that step of baptism, I would encourage you to, to do that, to come talk to me in the lobby, or um, you can give some more information online. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. So if you feel like God is, is making a change for you, you've decided to follow him, but haven't followed him in that step of baptism, come, come see us. We'd love to celebrate with you on that day. Um, another exciting thing, coming up April 17th, well, we're going to be, uh, maybe you don't know this, Kensington Traverse City is part of a larger Kensington movement. Most of the churches are down in Metro Detroit. We're kind of like an outpost of Kensington Church. On April 17th, we're doing a what we call a vision night. So we're going to celebrate what God has done in the Kensington movement, what God is doing, and what he will do um, with our new lead pastor, Brian Mowry. Uh, I have a little video I'd like you to, to see and help you, help you understand what's going on on vision night. I wanted a church where unchurched people could come to and enjoy it and be challenged with the uh, invitation to discover who Jesus was. In terms of the details, I had no idea. Uh, that's, that's where Mark Nelson came in. We felt it was imperative to provide um, music and drama and video and whatever we would use that was on the par with what they were seeing in their, in their week, whether it was on television or going to plays or listening to music at clubs. We wanted it to be something they could understand. The unorthodox mailers went out to 15,000 area homes, including that of a Detroit Free Press worker. Two weeks before Kensington's first service, this story showed up on the front page. First service, I was scared to death. Um, I mean, it was... I was more nervous than any football game I ever played. We opened the door to look outside to see if anybody's coming. <laughs> and, we, and I really thought, you know, there'd probably be a car or two. And we opened the door, and there's all these cars. Good morning. I'm going to welcome you to Kensington Community Church. I don't know what to comment on first <laughs> there. That's unbelievable. I don't know if I should comment on Steve Andrews' hair first or the advertisements that Kensington did in the very beginning. I think I couldn't tell if it was for a church or for, for a hunting program or not, but I think the thing I would say, it's like, man, like God has had such amazing favor on the life of this church, and he used people in powerful ways to draw uh, people who had no interest in church to come to church for the first time. And it's absolutely remarkable and I would say I am just so humbled to be a part of it now 
Um, I don't know if I'll do advertisements like that. I'm hoping I keep my hair. We'll see what happens <laughs> there. But I know that God has a great future for us. And that's what I wanted to share with you today quickly is just uh, an invitation. On April 17th, it's a Wednesday night. I'm calling the whole church to come together at our Troy campus. I wanna see each and every one of you there. What we're calling it is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know, it's so good for us to honor the past and honor the favor of God and the life of this church. Uh, we wanna do that well. We wanna honor the leaders of the church. We wanna honor all of you who have been such a significant part of seeing the growth of Kensington Church and seeing people come to know Jesus. I believe God really loves when his people honor one another. But also we wanna focus on today. There are great things happening right now as we move out in our communities, as we have these global partnerships, as we meet in seven campuses across Michigan. Amazing things are happening. People are being baptized. People are coming to faith. People are growing deeper in their faith through Alpha, all kinds of stuff to celebrate and things to pray for as well. How can we be praying for what God is doing now? But then we're gonna focus on tomorrow. You know, I've been here about eight months now and I'm so excited about what God has been laying on my heart and our heart as a church. I said to you when I first got here, we're gonna catch a vision together and I believe that the Lord is laying that vision out for us right now. And I want the opportunity to be able to share with you what tomorrow looks like. And so come on out. I encourage you, if somebody's not here right now, go tell them about it, April 17th, where we can come together and focus on yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I hope you can make that, put that on your calendar. April 17th is a big day. If, if at all possible, you can't make it. Um, we are actually going to have a vision night here on May 1st. It's another Wednesday night. We're going to do our mid-eats, our typical first Wednesday of the month mid-eats. And then we're going to have a vision night here. And Brian Mowry is actually going to come here. But I want to encourage you to not wait for that. If you can, join that larger movement. There's just something about being together. Um, I encourage you to do that on April 17th or, or May 1st. One last thing, um, Kensington has a board of elders that, that helps us keep on track. So it, Brian is the senior pastor of the whole Kensington movement. We also have a board of elders. We're looking to expand that board of elders to actually include some people from each campus. So Traverse City would have a voice on the elder board. Um, so how that works is a little bit strange um, to me. But what, we, what we're going to do is prayerfully consider who at this campus, uh, a non-staff person, would fit that role who is a, a strong follower of Jesus who w could help with the direction of the church. And how that would work is you would talk to them, and then they would fill out a recommendation application online. Does that make sense? So um, I want you to prayerfully consider uh, who would represent Traverse City on that, on that elder team, and then approach them, and then they can go online to fill out that application if they, they feel like God's making that move in them. Does that make sense? All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, we are right now in a series called Living the Jesus Way, and it has been so good for me just to focus on what Jesus did and how he did it. Here's a little uh, video to watch, but, but while that's, before that's playing, actually, why don't you stand up real quick, get the wiggles out, and maybe fist bump or handshake the person next to you, and maybe introduce yourself. Sometimes the things we really need might be different than what we thought. In Luke 19, Jesus borrows a donkey and begins to ride in Jerusalem. Verse 37 says, The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. The picture of the triumphant King riding on a donkey would have baffled the contemporaries of his time. Jesus was the perfect yet unexpected picture of the kingdom of God. Can we, above all, build what really matters for eternity? Can we live the Jesus way and put kingdom over culture?
Well, good morning, Traverse City. My name is Betty Dickinson. I serve on the teaching team here. And as Brent shared, we are in a series called Living the Jesus Way. And if you've been journeying with us, you've seen Jesus lives differently than what we often expect of leaders and kings of our day, right? We saw in the first week that Jesus puts people over religious practices and traditions, lifting up those who are most vulnerable and caring and seeing people more than the tradition of the day. We saw also in Zacchaeus' story that Jesus puts mercy over judgment and that he cares deeply to forgive and to reconcile people, right? And last week, Nate talked to us about how Jesus puts invitation over limitation, that there's certain limits that, our pla- that culture places on people. And we looked at, particularly last week, women at that time, and how Jesus' invitation into discipleship for Mary was countercultural to that day. And Jesus does this over and over and over again. And we're going to look at today Jesus' triumphal entry, how he puts the kingdom over the culture in the day. And we're going to get into that text. But before we get into that, I want to take up a moment to have, take up our offering at this time. So if I could have the ushers come forward. If you are new or visiting with Kensington, this moment is not for you. But if you've been with us for a while, you know and you've heard and even seen expressed in that video a little earlier some of the beautiful things that Kensington is doing as a, mov- a movement and that we get to be a part of that together. And so there's multiple different ways that you could give online or you could give in the pouches that are going to be passed here. Um, but I just want to invite you to consider opening your posture and generosity to partner together towards God's work through this community. So let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you that you have generously poured yourself out towards us, that you show us the way of your kingdom over the way of our culture at the time, at our time. And I just pray that you help us to receive from you what you want to pour into our hearts today, that you speak through the words that I say, and that you proclaim your message as you deeply embodied the way of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, several years ago, before I lived up here in Traverse City, my mom rented a little cottage on Glen Lake, and she invited all of us to come and have this wonderful vacation on Glen Lake together. And it happened to be my birthday over the time that we were together, and my mom is famous for making birthdays really, really special. So she's also notorious for making, especially birthday cakes, a very special event. And so even though she was going to be on vacation, she asked me, Betty, what kind of cake would you like? Now, I had a certain vision in my mind of what my favorite kind of cake is, and I will just say, on the back of the Betty Crocker cook, or on the back of the Betty Crocker box, it's called Better Than Almost Anything Cake. Some of you may know it by a different name, and I will not repeat that here. However, I had had this cake before, and my Aunt Jane had made it almost like a cake trifle where there was German chocolate cake and Heath bars and caramel and chocolate fudge and then Cool Whip and then another layer of German chocolate cake. I mean, it was rich and decadent, and in my mind, I'm picturing this cake, okay? And I get to the house where we're staying together, and my mom, so proud, brings out the cake but it's in a sheet pan, like it's in one of those, you know, 9 by 13 pans. And to this day, I still cringe at my response when I think about it, because rather than being grateful and expressing joy and gratitude for what she did, I was like, oh, I thought it was going to be like this, you know, and I was like communicating disappointment, And it crushed my mom. I mean, she had like labored to make this cake for me on her vacation and I expressed disappointment. And I'm still so ashamed of this, but I get in trouble for this a lot because as an artist, I have a very vivid imagination. And Stephen knows this, he's gonna laugh about me for this because I have a certain vision of something and how it's gonna look, kind of the end result. And then when it doesn't meet my expectations, I can communicate disappointment, and it's not always very kind or fair. And my poor mother, I had missed the point, right? I had missed the point that she had labored in love to make me this beautiful cake, and I was expressed disappointment. But I hope I'm not the only one who makes this kind of mistake every once in a while. I think we all know what it's like to have a certain expectation of something, 
and then the end result looks totally different, and we can sometimes miss the point, right? And in the text that we're going to look at today, the religious leaders in particular really struggled with this because in Jesus' triumphal entry, Jesus, the Jewish people sort of had this expectation around what a triumphal entry looks like because of the way they had seen it done in the Roman culture at the time. They had a certain expectation because of what they had seen already. But Jesus' triumphal entry is like a visual parable representing who he is like as a king and what his kingdom is about. And the way he did this, which was paradoxical to the way that people would have expected it at the time, so much so that when Jesus arrived as king, many people completely missed the point. And I want to actually fast forward to the end of Jesus' triumphal entry in the story And the text says this, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What is Jesus saying here? Why would Jesus say that peace was hidden from their eyes. And he is specifically addressing the religious rulers and the religious leaders of the time in Jerusalem. Maybe because they had a certain expectation in their mind about what a king looks like and what a triumphal entry looks like. And the reality is, we all kind of have certain expectations around peace. Right? So Jesus is referring to, you didn't know what peace looked like. And the Jewish religious leaders had a certain expectation of how peace is achieved by what they had already seen. But we all have kind of expectations around how we achieve peace. Or how to, and I'm just curious, as you think about your family of origin, or maybe you even think about our culture today, how do you see conflicts being resolved? Maybe you come from a kind of family culture that seeks peace through avoidance. Anybody have one of those kind of family cultures? Like, we're just going to brush the conflict under the rug, and we're going to intentionally not talk about religion or politics at the dinner table because it causes conflict, right? I know for me, I have two boys that tend to fight a lot. And sometimes it's just easier to say, just go in your separate rooms and just stay apart from each other, and then there will be peace. Anybody resonate with this? <laughs> if only there would be peace in the house by a lack of conflict. Or sometimes, they, you know, we separate culturally from one another, right? We think maybe peace can be achieved if we just stay apart from those who are different from us, from those that we may have conflict with or that we don't agree with. They say that Sunday morning is the most segregated part of the week, because we would rather stay with people that we understand, that we agree with, because it causes conflict when we come into contact with people who are different from us, right? And so better to keep the peace, peacekeeping, than to try to confront it, to confront those who are different. So we stay in our echo chambers online and in social media, it's even curated for the people that are like us, right? Because we don't like being disrupted by something different. And so we stay with the people that we know, that we understand, and who think and act like us. Well, maybe your family is used to this sense of peace through domination. Maybe you have a family member who, at a family gathering, they're the kind of person who, you know, in a debate, they will escalate their voice higher and higher and higher and higher until they make their point and prove their way and the other person relinquishes, right? Peace through domination happens when we have an argument and we want to win our way, and so we will use any kind of power that we have, our knowledge, our experience, our volume, to achieve peace through our way winning. Anybody like this? Okay, maybe I'm the only one. (laughs) But if we're honest, these mechanisms don't really lead to peace, do they? They may lead to silence, or compliance, or separating from one another, but this isn't real peace. In the passage we're going to look at today, Jesus shows us a better way. 
And the cultural approaches in reality aren't all that different from our own, where we see peace through domination or peace through avoidance. In fact, the Roman Empire was known as the Pax Romana, Roman peace. And Augustus Caesar was known as the king of peace at the time, but how he achieved peace was through this peace by domination. That he, and the triumphal entry was sort of the epitome of this way of peace. It was sort of the embodiment of this way of peace. And the Pax Romana was a 200 year obtained, government obtained law, order, and stability for the Roman Empire. And so when we're going to look at the victory parade, I just want you to have that in your mind that this way of peace was peace through domination. It was the Roman way imposing their way of doing life over all nations that they conquered. And it was peace in that way. And so I want to show a picture of what a, a triumphal entry would have looked like in the Roman Empire. And so a triumphal entry was like a victory parade where a general who had been victorious in, in, in a, um, a battle of some kind would kind of parade into the city. And as you can see in this picture, it's surrounded by a lot of pomp and circumstance. It was like street theater at its best. It was over the top and dramatic. And even as the Roman Empire grew in influence and wealth, so did these triumphal entries. It was where soldiers and citizens would sing the praise and hymns of the Roman ideals of strength and supremacy. And the victor would be crowned with this crown of laurel symbolizing military victory over their enemies. They would be pulled by four white horses, white symbolizing victory, and they would often drive the conquered kings, rulers, and captives before them. And then at the end of this triumphal entry, they would sacrifice their enemies to the god of Jupiter. Okay, this was like violence, pride, and it was the ends justified the means, right? So we are going to achieve peace through domination. And whatever means are necessary in order to get there is what we have to do, which often meant that the way of achieving peace was violence. It was oppressive. And it was subduing others and forcing the Roman way and putting everyone else under their thumb. Which impacted the most vulnerable at this time. This way of peace causes the most vulnerable to be inflicted in all kinds of oppression and pain because the Roman way exerted their power over those who had less power. Now, if we're honest, when we look at our world today, I think we can still see this way of peace being played out, right? On a systemic or communal level, this is where we have one ethnic group that places themselves above another ethnic group or people group. This is where we get the roots of every kind of ism there is. Racism, sexism, any other ism is where one people group says, my way is the best way. And so I'm going to exert my will, my power over another, usually the one who has less power, in order to achieve my way. And this is what we see play out in every kind of war that has existed over the history of time, right? If we look at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine right now, this is peace through violence and domination, right? Or if we look at Gaza and Israel, we see that the most vulnerable are the ones who are experiencing the most collateral damage, right? Where we see children and innocent people being crushed under this violent way of power. And if we're even more honest, we also know that Christians and sort of a Christian way of pursuing power is related to this way as well, right? If you think about the Crusades, it was conversion by the sword. Convert or die. Our way over your way. And if we're going to be even more honest, I'm just digging this hole. Like, I hope you can feel the tension with me. Just take a deep breath. <sighs> If we look at even our recent history here in Michigan, Christian border schools were established in Michigan and all throughout the United States in order to have the white European way of doing culture kind of supreme and superior over native peoples. 
And so children were taken from their homes and placed in Christian boarding schools where the First Nations people here were not able to speak their language. They were not able to wear their hair long. They had to have their hair cut. And if they were trying to speak their language, they would be punished and abused. This is not the way of God's kingdom, where my way is supreme over your way, or our way is supreme over your way. And this is not the way of the kingdom. But the Jewish people at the time, this is all they had seen happen, right? The only way to achieve peace is through this kind of dominance. And so when they longed for a Messiah, they had pictured a Messiah who would come as a king and achieve political rule over those who had oppressed them, okay? And in their prophetic imagination, they are remembering, this is around the time of Passover, okay? And in the Passover, they are remembering that they were oppressed in Egypt and that God rescued them from the hands of their oppressors and then established them, set them free from Egypt and established them as a nation in the people of Israel. And they are hoping for that again. And so zealots at this time would have really believed that the only way to peace, the only way that the Messiah could come and establish the the people of Israel as a nation to be who they were meant to be and kind of bring them back into the fullness of prosperity was through armed resistance. Violence and rebellion were necessary in order to achieve peace and justice. But Jesus' way is wholly other than this. Let's see what Jesus reveals about how his way of peace comes through his triumphal entry. It says this, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. And as he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one else has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over uh, over it for him to ride on. Now, what Jesus is doing here was such a drastic contrast that people would have likely missed it. And it would have been a little bit like, how many of you have been to the Cherry Festival Parade? Anyone? Do you like being a tourist in your own town? I do. So some of you may not. You're like, I avoid Cherry Festival things at all costs, and that's okay. But if you've been to the Cherry Festival Parade, you're familiar with one of the primary things in the parade is the procession of the Cherry Queen, right? And here's a picture of the procession of the Cherry Queen. This is Olivia Kuhlman, the Cherry Capital Queen from a couple years ago. And, you know, she's famously riding on this convertible. She's got a crown. She's waving. She's got a sash, right? Now I want you to imagine being at the Cherry Festival and instead of the Cherry Queen riding down on this beautiful convertible, you know, she's got no makeup, no crown, and is riding a tricycle. Do you think you would even recognize the Cherry Queen at this moment? No, I probably would not either. And what Jesus is doing here is very similar. His triumphal entry was a little bit like that, that instead of a war chariot pulled by war horses, Jesus' triumphal entry looked a little bit more like this. You see how close he is to the people? Here he's riding on a donkey. There's children going before him. And the people are sort of laying their cloaks down, welcoming Jesus as king. Now, just because Jesus was riding on a donkey... And it would have been different than war horses. He is making an incredible political statement here. This whole scene is incredibly politically charged, okay? Because he is showing and really confronting the way of power through the war horse with the way of the donkey, okay? And it, it references how this, this entry began at the Mount of Olives, which it had been prophesied that the Messiah would show up at the Mount of Olives. And this triumphal entry procession was only a mile long, right? Jesus didn't need a donkey to walk a mile in that time, but he chooses a donkey intentionally, confronting the way of the Roman power, violent culture with the way of his kingdom. And 
if the people of Israel, if the Jewish religious leaders had remembered their roots of what the Messiah had even been prophesied to be, I think they would have recognized him. Because it even says in this prophecy about the Messiah in the book of Zechariah, it says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus confronts the way of the war horse, the epitome of pride and domination and violence, with the donkey, which would have represented the way of humility and compassion. If the war horse conveyed, I, a king, is coming in war, a donkey represented a king who comes in peace. And this was deeply the embodiment of who Jesus was. We've seen him portrayed this way in all of the Gospels, in this whole series leading up to this point, right? Jesus rejected the religious and political power that he could have taken. Instead, choosing the way of humility by descending to be with the most lowly, oppressed, and vulnerable people to identify himself, even becoming homeless, not carrying any wealth, not achieving anything that he could have had by the way of being God, and instead chose to associate with the poor, the weak, and the oppressed. Because Jesus establishes his kingdom of peace through humility over pride. And in the second half of this prophecy in Zechariah, It expresses this idea of peace here when it says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace, he being the Messiah. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Why would he take away the chariots and war horses and the battle bow be broken? Because in God's kingdom, there is no need for these implements of war. Why? Because God's kingdom achieves peace through love over violence, choosing the donkey over the war horse. And if the war horse is forcing my way through power and violence and might, The donkey is yielding my way and using my power to liberate and heal and uplift, to empower, especially those who are most vulnerable. And we actually see this response from the people, the people who they lay their cloaks down, which have been kind of like laying down the royal red carpet for Jesus. They see, the disciples, they see this is the kind of king that God has promised. This is what the Messiah looks like. And instead of praising his military victory and supremacy through violent overthrow, they praise him for what? They say, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. What's fascinating is this word miracles in the Greek is the same word for power. This is how Jesus used his power, right? That they praised Jesus because rather than wielding his power over people through violence, Jesus used his power for people through love, that he uplifts, that he chooses to use his power not for himself, but for others, forsaking the way of pride that put himself, would have put himself at the center and centers others. That instead of choosing violence, he chooses love. Do you see this contrast happening here? The way of the war horse and the way of the donkey. Now, if I am completely honest with myself, I choose the way of the war horse more often than I care to admit, right? 
where Stephen and I will be getting in a conflict. And just the other day, you know, we were folding laundry together on the bed, and we had all the laundry laid out there. And Stephen has his way of folding the laundry, and I have my way of folding the laundry. And Stephen's way of folding the laundry is he takes, you know, he separates first. He separates out, you know, like, oh, here's the boys' clothes, here's Isaiah's, here's Winston's, here's Betty's, here's mine, and then he folds them. And I'm thinking, like, that's not very efficient because, like, you could totally take a piece out, just touch it once, fold it, and put it in the right pile, right? And and inside of me, I knew I'm preparing for this message, and inside of me, I'm going, like, this isn't the way. Like, and I, you know, was resisting every part of me that said, you're doing it wrong. You have to do it this way, right? And if I were to have taken that moment to force my way into how the laundry was folded, I would have taken the way of the war horse, right? It is hard to walk the way of peace and to say, I am going to allow you to do your way and I want to center you and center your opinions and allow and to listen and to seek and to understand Oftentimes, when I am in a work project, and again, I have certain expectations of how a project is supposed to go, and as a leader, if I'm not careful, I can kind of enforce my way and make my way happen through any kind of power of communication that I may have, through my knowledge, through my skills, or even through, if I'm the leader of the team, just the the nature of having power over others, right? And push my way to my agenda and my way of a project and what I want it to look like instead of listening to the voices of others on the team and elevating those and seeking out the voices who are not heard in the meeting. This way of the war horse and the donkey shows up all the time, and we have a choice. Which way are we going to choose? And what about you? Perhaps in conflict, if you've had conflict with someone, do you seek retaliation or revenge when someone hurts you? Or do you choose the way of the donkey by seeking understanding and forgiveness? In politics, we see this happen all the time. And whether we like it or not, there is a political election coming up. And I know we don't want to think about it. But this is our moment to lean in and ask ourselves, are we going to choose the way of the war horse where we get in a debate with someone and we say, My way wins, and we do whatever we can to convince the other person that we are right. And so we speak over other people, and we try to justify things, and we use our knowledge and our skills and our fact-checking to say, this is the right way. Why don't you believe me? You're so dumb. Why don't you think like I do? Or... Will we get into a discussion where we are seeking to understand, we are seeking to empathize, and we're trying to see their perspective and why they view things the way that they do? Which one will you choose in this political season? The way of the war horse or the way of the donkey? And at the end of Jesus' triumphal entry, when the people had totally missed him, his disciples got it, but the religious leaders and many others completely missed him, he weeps over the city because they had a certain expectation around how that end goal of peace is reached through violence. And I believe he also wept because he knew where violence leads, right? That he could see the writing on the wall that if we pursue this way of peace, it leads to death and destruction, and the oppression of the most vulnerable. And that breaks Jesus' heart. That breaks Jesus' heart. And I love the way that Dr. Reverend Dr. Justo Gonzalez puts this. He said, they are so afraid of what Rome might do that they cannot see what God is doing. We trust the peace of armaments, the peace of vigilance, and even the peace of isolation from those we fear. But we find it difficult to practice the peace of love. Jesus, who wept over Jerusalem, still weeps over our cities and nations. Let me ask you something. Where do you think Jesus is weeping today? What is he weeping over? I think Jesus is weeping over Israel and Gaza right now. I think his heart breaks 
for the number of people who've been killed in this violence, children who've lost their lives in this violence. I think Jesus is weeping over Russia and Ukraine, and I think he's weeping over every action that we take where we choose the war horse and choose to prove and defend and seek our way instead of the way of God's kingdom of love. And Jesus is inviting us to follow him in the way of choosing the donkey. But I'll tell you, just like Jesus' triumphal entry was a confrontation, when we choose this way of peace, it is a direct confrontation to the principalities and the powers of this dark world that choose the war horse. And there will be consequences and backlash for seeking that way of peace, right? Where, in the end, where does Jesus' way of peace lead? Instead of being crowned with laurels, he's crowned with thorns. And instead of ending his triumphal entry, sacrificing his em- enemies at the temple of Jupiter, his triumphal entry ends with his own sacrifice on the cross rejected and condemned to death by the very people who praised him as king because they didn't get it. And we see this all over the place that when people seek this way of peace, of nonviolent resistance, we think of the civil rights movement, right? Nonviolent resistance to seek the way of peace where others had been separated, where there was injustice and say, no, I will say no to oppression and no to violence and I will instead, instead of choosing the way of hate, I'm going to choose the way of love even to the sacrifice of my own life. And that many civil rights leaders and those who participated in this movement encountered violence and abuse from the way of the war horse. And I think Jesus weeps over that. And his invitation is the same today. Will you confront the ways of power of violence and hate and oppression with love? And can you do it with the means of love and compassion and humility instead of the means of violence and hate and anger? You see, where our culture seeks to achieve peace through separation or through domination... Jesus' way of peace comes through reconciliation. In fact, this word peace, shalom or arene, means to join or to tie together, to bring wholeness and flourishing and life where two parts are brought together in a whole of something new. And I love the way that Paul describes this in Ephesians 2. It says this, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, meaning the Jewish people and the Gentiles, every other nation. He's brought them together as one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh with a law, its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity, thus making peace, and in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. Do you see this beautiful picture that Jesus paints of a new humanity here? Joining of disparate parts together into oneness with himself, creating something new and beautiful. Not your way, not my way, but our way together in Jesus. And a couple days ago, I had this profound experience, which was actually a really relative, uh, relatively frequent occurrence where I was cooking upstairs and I heard this noise where a familiar sound of my youngest crying. And so I come downstairs and see this very familiar scene where Isaiah, the oldest, he had, they had been building with these sort of medieval tower blocks, okay? And Isaiah has his kingdom, which is like 40 pieces big, And Winston has his little kingdom that he's building, which is maybe 10 pieces big, okay? And so already you can see this sort of power dominance coming up here in the oldest and the youngest kind of thing, which happens a lot. 
But not only did Isaiah take most of the pieces, but then he started throwing some of his pieces at Winston's little kingdom. And this just broke his heart. And when I came downstairs and I saw this, I just held Winston and rocked him. And I was just weeping with him. And there was a big part of me, like this longing for justice, that just wanted to say, like, Isaiah, you know, go in time out or go in your room. This was one approach that I could have taken. Or I could have said, you know, like, let's just distribute the pieces evenly. Winston, you know, you can have 40 pieces, and Isaiah, you can have 40 pieces. You can build your separate kingdoms, and it'll be fine, right? These are the two different ways, right? Peace through separation or peace through domination. And instead, I don't know if it was the prompting of the Holy Spirit or what, but I just said, you know what, Winston, why don't you bring your pieces over here? And we're going to work together to build a different kingdom. And Winston, what do you want to create? Like, let's create a little garden terrace. And so we took Winston's blocks and we added a garden terrace together. And I want to show you a picture of what it looked like in the end. And so together, this was the kingdom that they had built, which was really beautiful. And what I loved about it is Winston brought his ideas and his blocks to the table And his voice was heard and honored, and his resources were honored. And Isaiah shared his resources, and he listened to Winston's ideas. And together they formed this beautiful kingdom. And that is the picture of what Jesus wants to form in his kingdom, where those whose voices have been excluded, those who have less power, are invited to the table in equal partnership to create something beautiful. This is the way of peace that forms peace not through separation or through domination, but through reconciliation where the parts are brought together in one whole. And 2 Corinthians 5 says this, that as the church, we have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Church, do you know that this is our call by God? the ministry and the message of reconciliation as though God were making his appeal through us. Be reconciled to God. Those of you who've been far away, those of you who have distanced yourself from one another, those of you who have hated one another and separated or sought to dominate over another, be reconciled to God in Christ. Reconciled to God reconciled to one another, and reconciled to creation itself. This is the picture of the kingdom of God, of the way God's kingdom comes in peace. Kensington Traverse City, this is our call in our city. With the message of reconciliation, which means that every part of our city where there is division, where there is brokenness, where there is violence and rebellion against God's way of peace, that we would confront it with the love of God that says no more. No more those lowly and oppressed in homelessness or poverty. No more you are brought to the table. No more where certain voices are excluded. You are brought to the table of loving union and reconciliation, which means that we would be known as a people who are about the work of healing. That wherever there is brokenness or division or disease, wherever there is wounding, particularly of those who are most vulnerable, we would say no. That we would stand in the gap and seek the way of healing, of joining, of reconciliation and peace. That we would seek the wholeness and the flourishing of all people in our community, that we would be a prophetic voice of justice where there has been violence, that we would confront it with love and protect and uplift the most vulnerable and the lowly in our community. This is our call. We are called to be agents of peace, peace makers. Those who bridge divides, heal wounds, and foster understanding and unity within our communities and beyond. Which as an aside, this is why I love so much one of our move out groups called Beloved 360 that does this work. This is what we're there for. As well as the course Undivided, where we are coming together to seek understanding of those who are different from us, seeking to live out the message and the ministry of reconciliation. 
And just this past week, I was at a city council meeting and someone read in public comments words that were written by a former mayor, Richard Lewis. And in 1981, the UN had established the International Day of Peace. And so in 2022, the mayor of Traverse City declared that September 21st would be the International Day of Peace in Traverse City. I don't know if you knew that or not. I did not know that until this week. So put September 21st on your calendar. And when he declared that, he wrote this. And I just think this is a beautiful way to end and a profound vision of who we are called to be and what we are called to be in this community. He said, achieving true peace entails much more than laying down arms. It requires the building of societies where all members feel they can flourish. It involves creating a world in which people are treated equally, regardless of their race. By recognizing this day, we in Traverse City, which is a member of the International Cities of Peace, devote ourselves to a world and community peace and encourage all of humankind to work in cooperation towards this goal for at least this day and perhaps carry this day over into the next and the next and the next. Let us dedicate this day to peace building and through our continued efforts, create a culture of peace. We will think peace. We will act peace. We will be peace. Amen. Let this be so. Let me just pray this over us. Jesus, we thank you that you modeled a completely different way of your kingdom, that your way of peace came not through violence or pride, but through humility and through love. Would you help us, Jesus, to follow you and to take take to heart that we have been commissioned with the message and the ministry of reconciliation and show us, Lord, what that means for each of us individually and for us collectively as a community. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together as we sing this final song. And we'll sing, Great Are You, Lord.
Amen. May we be committed to the ministry and message of reconciliation, right? And this week is Holy Week. We're leading up to Easter and Good Friday. We're going to talk about what Jesus did in reconciling us to himself and to one another. And I encourage you too. we have these little cards, take them with you and invite a friend to Easter service as well. And just as a reminder, too, that we are looking for those in our community who feel this call to represent this community as elders. It's an gr- incredible responsibility. And so if you have someone in mind that you're thinking, like, this person would be great, tell them. Say, go apply. Go apply online to be an elder because I think you would really represent us well. What, what a great way to encourage one another, right? Even if you don't actually get the thing. To know somebody sees that in you is just a beautiful gift. And so bless you, my friends. May you enjoy the rest of your week. Have a wonderful Holy Week, and we'll see you back here Good Friday and Easter. Take care.